Okay, so let's talk about embedding of manifolds. So today we'll touch a little bit on differential geometry just because we're talking about manifolds. Um, firstly, let's just talk about embedding or embedding the same thing. So there's not really a difference. Uh, I believe typically topologists use embedding and differential geometers use embedding. It's like just choice language, but they mean the kind of same thing. And it's actually an example of a much bigger mathematical concept. Um, so it's the idea of one mathematical structure contained within another. Um, so, you know, whenever we study a structure, we, one of the first things we always do is look at substructures, so we have subgroups, subspace topology, subrings, etc. Um, so that's kind of looking sort of internally within a mathematical object to look at its substructure. Um, but there's also, you can sort of look, kind of look externally and you think well, we've got our thing, is there some sort of superstructure in which uh, we can um, embed uh, our thing as a, as a substructure. And whenever you, whenever you do this kind of thing, you've always got to be careful about uh, the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, so, so intrinsic property, right, is just something that that, that mathematical object has in of itself. And extrinsic comes from when we put it inside a bigger thing, it might inherit stuff that comes from that outside thing. So a good example of that is curvature. So typically when you think about a function, you take its second derivative, you kind of thinking about second derivative somehow measures the curvature of a function, right? Like whether it's concave up or concave, yeah. But that's totally reliant on putting that curve, that function, the graph of the function inside R2. And, and so uh, if we change the axes, we're gonna change what the second derivative is. And so the second derivative is kind of like, is not an, uh, an intrinsic, thing of the actual geometric object of that curve, right? It's only when we put that curve in axes. And so um, if you remember from Calc 2, there's this other definition, of, there's this idea of curvature where um, Remember this one where you have a, a, a curve and you look at um, kind of like, you, you kind of put in a circle of best fit and then you look at the radius of that circle and the curvature is one over the radius of that circle of curvature. Do you remember that from Calc? You didn't do that in Calc 2? Ah, what are they teaching Calc 2? Yeah. But anyway, this is kind of an, an intrinsic thing about the curve. It's just kind of, even though it comes from something um, external, right? We're still putting it inside R2. It's still a property of the curve that the curve has itself. And, and so the idea is like, if you were an ant living on that, on that graph and you couldn't you know, see the outside space, there, is, there are ways in which you can measure the curvature. Just like when we're here on earth, we can kind of measure the curvature of time space even though that's something that's in like something four dimensional. So, so there's a whole this idea of intrinsic versus ex, extrinsic. 
so typically we really love intrinsic things. Okay, so uh, so whenever you study study things uh, in geometry, differential geometry, for instance, it's an important thing to say, oh, this property is an intrinsic thing to the curve or the surface or the manifold itself. And it's not dependent on how we place it in Euclidean space. Okay, so, so in general, when you've got some object embedded in another object, um, the embedding is given by an injective map. And that has to be structure preserving. So for example, subgroup inside a group. Well, if you think of the, the subgroup as some other, say S3, the, the symmetric group on three letters, we can put it inside the symmetric group four letters right and there's a, a natural map that injection that goes that and that map also has to be structure preserving it has to be a, a homomorphism if we're in groups ring homomorphism and something to do with rings uh, uh, a homeomorphism if it's in topology uh, if we're talking about differential geometry we also want uh, the map to be smooth, all kinds of stuff like that. You want it to preserve structure. Okay. Sometimes you see this kind of notation. Have you seen this notation before? Um, although that's usually reserved for an, an inclusion map. Again, this is from looking at things e extrinsically and intrinsically. Um, because if you if you give them Two objects, right? X could be in Y, but there might be lots of different ways that you can put X in Y. So, for example, if X is R and Y is R2, there's lots of ways that you can stick R into R2, right? Any line is going to be R. Um, but usually, um, there's like a standard or canonical way. So canonical just means something like it's standard. So for example, the, the standard way that you would put R in R2, would you, you would, you know, you would map X to X0, for example. Okay. And, and so quite often you reserve this notation as kind of canonical things where. And so here we're identifying R with the horizontal axis, the x-axis in um, R2. Um, and in that way, you can you identify the domain with the range, even though uh, technically speaking, they're different objects. We just regard them as the same. But it's just convenient to do that. But again, this is all this thing between extrinsic and intrinsic, which is something you always got to keep in the back of your mind. So we're in we're in topology. So in topology, an embedding is uh, a map which is a homeomorphism onto its image, and and that then, if you've got a homeomorphism onto its image, uh, so an injective map. Um, such that the inverse is continuous from its image back to the domain, um, that is an, that's how we embed X into Y. So this is all cool. Okay. So have you seen manifolds before? Okay. So uh, an M manifold is a house dwarf type base space with a count of basis. Uh, such that, oh, that should be little x, such that little, every point accent has a neighborhood homeomorphic with an open subset of, uh, of some uh, of Rm. Okay, so for example, um, a circle is a one manifold, right? Because if you take any point, 
you've got a neighborhood there, and that's homeomorphic to an open interval in R1. Uh, if you take a sphere, that's a two manifold. If you take any point, take a little neighborhood of it, you get a little disk, and that's homeomorphic to um, something in R2. Um, so a circle is an example of a curve, which is what we call one manifold, and a two manifold is a surface, like a sphere. Why, why would you want to say neighborhood that is homeomorphic to RN? Well, this isn't. Oh, well, I guess I guess it is because, well, it is, isn't it? Because a an open interval is homeomorphic to the whole of R. Well, so really, what we mean by an open subset is like a, an open disk. Okay, um, but, which is homeomorphic to not, Rn. We're not saying basis element. It's, so it could be like a horrible union of open subsets. I don't know. Um, just kind of but the thing, even if it's a horrible union, like you can you can still yeah. you can still find just one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so so it's simple and and. It, and you want to say an open subset of Rm uh, because, so say we take a circle here, and okay, so we've got our little, little open interval here. So what we really want to do when, when we're doing differential geometry is to have, to be able to differentiate. So we want a tangent space. So, uh, so each point, because it's homeomorphic to an open subset of Rm, we can sort of place it in entirely in Rm. And we can do calculus there. Okay. So this is my, my next thing. Um, manifolds are important objects in different ge differential geometry and algebraic topology and uh, algebraic geometry. Um, so they're called manifolds when we want to emphasize, in English, we say manifolds when we want to emphasize their topology and geometry. We call them variety in English if we want to emphasize their algebraic structure. But like in other languages, that distinction doesn't hold. So like in French, they, they, call, they call them all varieties, not variété or whatever. So they have the same word. I believe it's the same thing in Japanese as well. Um, uh, but if you want to do these kind of things, you, you need additional structures. And you get additional structure because, right, you've got an open subset of Rm. So you can, you can, you can attach to each point an Rm, like a whole linear space. And you can do on that all the stuff that you can do linear algebra with. So, for example, in differential geometry, you have these things called charts. So here is a chart. Here is just an R. And on, the, on that, you can do calculus. And the idea then is, here's a chart that's nearby. And so there is a way that you can where you can go from doing stuff here to doing stuff there, like smoothly. So that needs to be, you have like a, like a Jacobian or something which allows you to transfer uh, things in here to things in there. And so you can do a differential geometry. And, and, and once you have like a vector space, you can then do all kinds of things. Like um, you can put uh, a Riemannian metric which is not kind of like a metric, how you think about metric for metric spaces. A metric is something which, um, a Riemannian metric is something which takes two vectors and does something, you've got like a bilinear form, have you? 
done stuff with what? So a bilinear form. Oh, the most typical bilinear form you've seen is the dot product. All right. And so anytime you've got a bilinear form, so it's bilinear, so it's, it's linear in each thing, and you can write it as some matrix. Okay. And, but there's some symmetric matrix that gives you your bilinear form. And if you know your linear algebra, symmetric matrices have only real eigenvalues. So that means any bilinear form is determined by its signature, which is the number of positive eigenvalues, the number of negative eigenvalues, and the number of zero eigenvalues. And so a bilinear form of the same, once of the same signature, there's a, a transformation that takes one bilinear form to another. And so if you've got a, a bilinear form which has all positive eigenvalues, that gives you a Riemannian metric like the dot product, which allows you to make lengths and angles just like the dot product does in, in normal um, uh, Rn. But there's other kinds of forms as well. There's uh, a thing called a symplectic form, which is a, uh, a skew, skew form. So uv equals minus the u, if you switch it. And that's important in Hamiltonian. It comes up naturally whenever you do Hamiltonian mechanics. Um, so this, this has got a signature one minus one. Uh, and then there's the Lorentzian metric, which has signature three, one, right? So because you've got three positive eigenvalues for space and one negative eigenvalue for time. And that's how you do general relativity with this Lorentzian metric. So having, having this space attached to it, like an Rn attached to it, allows you to do all the stuff from linear algebra. And so you can, it's just like tons you can do. And so you do a whole, it's a whole topic. Um, okay, what do we, what, what do we, so, so we're not doing anything with derivatives. So I'm just saying that's how differential geometry comes into it. Um, so we showed a couple of lectures ago, lectures ago that any regular space with a countable basis can be embedded in uh, R omega. And so what we're going to do is show that uh, that any compact manifold can be embedded in a finite dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, but it's actually true for any manifold, but, but we're only going to prove it for compact ones. But um, there's a whole bunch of famous Zeni theorems. Um, so, so this is Nash, the famous Nash from uh, A Beautiful Mind. He's kind of one of the pioneers of game theory. He's actually super famous for his embedding, uh, embedding theorem, which says that any Riemannian manifold can be isometrically. So that means it uh, preserves distance uh, into some finite dimension of Euclidean space. And there's a, another famous embedding theory, the Whitney embedding theory, which says that. Uh, any smooth M manifold, so smooth means just means that it's, uh, we're talking about derivatives here. So we're asking the derivative, the Jacobian to be injective, can be smoothly embedded into R2M. And this is the best you can get uh, because if you look at the real projective spaces, RP2 to the N, where, where the even power, you cannot embed it, smoothly embed it in, um, in R 
sort of double its dimension. And that's a, it's actually a really nice result that it's some algebraic topology. So, so one of the things you do in algebraic topology, right, is you take uh, spaces and you attach algebraic objects to them. So typically you can attach a group to a, um, an algebraic object. And, but then if you've got a continuous map between two topology, between two topological objects, if you look at the groups that they have, that uh, continuous map turns into a homomorphism, group homomorphism. And so you can solve problems in topology by using group theory. And so this is, this is an example of that. It's, it's pretty cool. But algebraic topology is a whole other subject. Um, so just, uh, so for example, R, since we've talked about RP2 beforehand, there's a famous um, surface called Bois surface. And this is an immersion of RP2 into R3. So an immersion is like a, just a local embedding. So it's not, an embedding like we're interested because it has uh, self intersecting points. So, can so you it's just like a, a neighborhood at some point that is? Yeah, so, so, so in each, each neighborhood, you, there's a way that you can kind of straighten it out. So so. The point and then, and then the yeah, but the, the trouble is you get intersections, so you've got to be careful how you, you've got to sort of separate how things, but you can make it, you can make it work. Um, and uh, and so since you've done you're doing complex analysis, Kevin Easy, yeah. So this is how you do it. Um, so here is um, so W is a complex number. And so what you do is you're taking the complex disk. So this is the uh, with, the, with um, an absolute value less than or equal to one, uh, and you're mapping it onto a surface. Um, so here is these three functions, and then these. This is the parameterization of of the thinking. And here's a famous statue which lies outside of a wolf whack, which is the the head uh, German. Uh, mathematical institute. It's kind of like the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton. Um, and so here they've got a statue of it here. And these bands of steel are actually Mobius strips. And it shows you how the, it's, it, shows, it shows you how it all kind of self intersects. Um, and, the, and the reason why this works, right, is when you look at this, it's got the property that the point associated with a complex number is the same point uh, associated with minus one over the conjugate of it. Okay, and so now you see why this is less than or equal to one because, right, if, if this has absolute value less than one, this has absolute value greater than one. So, if you take it over whole C, every point is counted twice. And the way that, it, and so actually on this, you actually don't need the full disk. You only need half the boundary because these points are associated, are identified with those points. And I think I've, I've told you about stereographic progression, uh, projection. So if you think of the, of, of C, right, you've got the complex plane. If you look at it one, right, so here is over the complex plane. And uh, here is the Riemann sphere, which is the one point compactification of C. So here's the North Pole. And so the way that it works, right, is you, 
if you've got some point here. So the Northern hemisphere is sent to complex numbers with modulus greater than one. The equator is sent to uh, the unit circle and the Southern hemisphere is sent to points inside the, uh, inside the disk. And so if, if you look at this point here and you look at its antipodal point here, right, and then you, right, so these are two points on the, uh, on the Riemann sphere. This is a right angle, right? Because we, we're looking at like a slice of it here. And so if this is the number omega, this number here is um, minus one over omega conjugate. And you can see that because um, these, these lines have to be negative reciprocals of each other. And this length here is modulus of omega. So this length here must be one over modulus of omega. And so this is why this works. And so this thing, since it has this property, it, <laughs> it does the right thing. It sends antipodal points to the same point, which is what happens in RP2. In fact, I can show you a little video of it. Oops, hang on, it's not, why is it not? Okay. Sure. Oh, I got it. Huh. It's not turning up at all, is it? Having the same, okay. Let me just show you it. So here it is. So it starts off with a Mobius band, which has been given three twists. And then it, it kind of widens the Mobius band. And you see it kind of intersecting with each other. And you can see right at the middle of the center, there's a triple point. And, uh, Another, another cool animation is if I can make this thing work. And so in this one here, you see a Mobius band, which is kind of rotating over the surface of the thing. Anyway, that's just a cool little thing. So that belongs to the intersection Okay, so let's get on to what we want to do today. Um, so we have to do some technicalities. So if we've got a function from any space to R, then the support of that function is the closure of the set of the inverse image of the non-zero element. Um,
And, and so you need to know, notice that if X lies outside the, the support of phi, then there is some neighborhood of X on which phi vanishes. And so the, the main thing we want to talk about is the partition of units today. So let's say we're given some finite index open covering of our space and also an, an indexed family of continuous functions from our space to zero one, then it's a partition of unity dominated by this collection. If the support of phi i lies within u i, and for each x in the space, if you add up all the phi x's at that point, you'll get to one. Um, in general, you don't you don't need um, this to be finite. It can be uh, an it can be an uncountable collection of uh, open sets and functions, just as long as for each x there's a neighborhood on which all but a finite number of the phi are, are zero for it to work. And partitions of unity are really, really important in, uh, in differential geometry and uh, topology because what, 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 what they're for is they, you go, it's how you go from local to global. So if you've got some local property which you want to show the whole space has, then you, if you, you, then the way to do it is to use a partition of unity. It's just the way to extend from local to global, as you'll see in this. Okay, so the first theorem we have to do is to show that for a normal space, uh, there, there exists part, uh, finite partitions of unity. Um, and in fact, again, this is, we can use this as actually as a, a definition of normal spaces. So like if a space can be, can always be done, we can always find a partition of unity, whatever, we, then it's normal. But anyway, so here is, uh, it's, so this is the, the main technical proof. So we, it's a little bit. So, so what you do is by using norm, normality of X, we take our covering and we find a new open covering. It's still gonna be an open covering of X with the same number of sets, except the closure of our V's are gonna be contained within U for each I. And that's where we use normality for that. Well, we can keep on doing this, right? Because if V is a finite index open covering, then we can find another, we can, we can shrink it to a smaller open covering of W's, such that the closure of W's uh, contained in the V, that's as far as we go, because that's enough then to use units on for Right, because we've got two, Closed sets, we've got our closures of W and is that supposed to be V or U? If I screwed up with this, it's just going to be U. Oh no, it's, it's B. Okay. Okay, so using Urison's lemma on these uh, two closed sets here, we can find a continuous function. 
And then we just normalize these functions to get our desired uh, things. Okay. So again, it's it's uh, Urison's lemma is the thing that's doing all the heavy lifting for us. Everything else is really kind of basic. So step one uh, is this lemma. What, what we're going to do is given our open covering, we want to be able to shrink it to this open covering such that the closure of each, each of these VIs is contained within UIs. And we just use induction for that. So we let A1 be the closed set of X minus everything in that open covering except U1. Since this is an open covering of X, this set here has to be contained within U1, right? Because U1 has to contain everything that's not in U2 through UN. Now we use normality of X. We can choose an open set V1 containing A1 with the closure of V1 being inside U1. So that's just using normality. And so then we can throw away U1 and replace it with by V1, and it's still going to be an open covering, right? Because V1 contains A1, which remember is all the stuff in X, which is not in U2 through U in. And so we just repeat. So in each step, let's say we've done it for the first K1, um, We've eliminated U1 through UK minus one, and now we want to eliminate UK. We want to replace UK with BK. Well, we just let AK be the closed set X minus all the Vs uh, we've already gotten, and then minus also all the other Us except UK. Same thing happens. This has to lie within UK, right? Because this is an open covering and this is everything in X, which is not in these Vs and Us. So it has to be in UK. Again, X is normal. So now we, that gives us a VK containing AK with its closure within UK. And so then we throw away UK and replace it with VK. And it's still an open covering of X. And after N steps, we get the result. So there's a lot there that's really, it's really just a straightforward induction. Okay, so. We want to show that part finite partitions of unity exist. So we're given a finite index open covering of X. And we want, we want to find a partition of unity dominated by the U. Okay, so by the lemma, we find a covering by these. We apply the lemma again, and we get a covering of X of the Ws, such that the W, the closure of the Ws is Wi is within Vi, and the closure of Vi is in within Ui for each I. So the closure of Wi and X minus Vi are two disjoint closed sets. So by the Urison lemma, we can separate them. 
So that means we got a this is psi, isn't it? Yeah, we've got psi i from x to zero one, so psi i on x minus v i is zero, and psi i on the closure of w i is one. And the important thing is that the support of the psi i's is contained within the closure of the v i's, which is contained within u i. The other thing to notice is that if we add up the size on X, it's going to be greater than or equal to one, right? Because um, we've got a covering of X, each X has to be in the support of at least, uh, has to be in, in, in at least one of these sets. So it's going to, there, there exists a psi I such that, um, psi of x equals one. So if we add them all up, we're going to get some number that's bigger than equal to one. So sometimes with partitions of unity, all you need is a function that's positive everywhere. Other times you need it actually to add up to one. But one implies the other, right? Because we can normalize it. So we just define phi of i to be psi of i divided by the total uh, of the psi i's. And we're allowed to, this is well defined, right? Because this number is always greater than or equal to one. So we're allowed to divide by. <laughs> And all we need to notice is that it works. Firstly, it's continuous. The phi i's are continuous because the sides are continuous. The support of this function is the same as the support of this function, the support of the numerator, which is contained within ui. So that works. And if we sum some the phi i is at each point, then the numerator and the denominator are the same, and both numbers, so positive numbers, so it's one by the other four points going to be in one. Why are those points the same? Sorry? Why exactly are those points? The same? Be because here we, so, so if we look at this, we can just ignore this, right? Because this is just going to be some number that's far away from zero. But far away from zero, right? It's, it's, it's bigger than one, definitely. And so this function vanishes precisely where the size vanishes. Anything that's outside of ui, you're going to get psi i equal to zero. So that means phi i is equal to zero. Okay. Embedding of manifolds. This theorem is just amazing because it's so easy now. Typically embedding theorems are super, super hard. <laughs> so this is, this is such a joy. Okay, so if X is a compact manifold, then we can embed uh, X in some finite dimensional Euclidean space. Actually, where the real hard work is, is in coming up with um, bounds for this N. That's where. Okay, since X is a manifold, we have an open cover by neighborhoods homeomorphic to an open subset of RM. 
right? Because so, but then since X is compact, we can, can but we can refine that uh, uncountable cover to a finite subcover. And Right, each has a neighborhood homeomorphic to some neighborhood of RM. So each set comes with its own embedding into RM. Um, since X is compact and Hausdorff, and manifolds have to be Hausdorff, it's normal. So therefore, since we have a finite subcover, we can come up with a partition of unity dominated by that finite subcover. Okay, and so just let AI equal the support of that HVPI. And then we're going to, for each I, we're going to define a function from X to RM by. Uh, HI of X is equal to phi I times GI if X is in UI. So remember what these things are. This is a vector in RM. This is a, a scalar multiple of it. And this is just the zero vector in, in RM. Um, so the main thing to worry about is that the functions are well-defined and continuous, and they are because uh, of uh, the partitions of unity, uh, they agree on wherever these things intersect. Because if something, if X is in this intersect of this, um, then it's outside the support of the I to zero on there. So we've, we've kind of pasted together these two continuous functions. Okay, so we have defined a function from X to RM. And so now we want our embedding. And so we're going to define a function from X to Rn times M plus one by um, F of X is equal to the fees of X and the H's of X. So, so remember this kind of make, so you have to make sense of what this means, right? So these are numbers. So each one of these things, but each one of these is a vector in Rm. So that's so that's how we get to the n times n plus one there. Can we just do the n in the end? Less than no n comes from the partition of unity. Oh. Right, n is the number of sets that you needed. Oh, right, okay. All right. So M is what the what the what the dimension of the manifold is, N is the number of open covers that you need. Right. So this is the partition of unity, and these are these things that you've done here. And it, it's clearly continuous, right? Because each of these functions is continuous. So, um, so now we have to show that it's a homeomorphism, but because it's compact Hausdorff, actually uh, the only thing we need to show is that it's injected. Uh, because theorem 26.6 which shows, shows that if it's injected, then the inverse is um, is there. And then we're almost done. How to show it's injective. So what happens if fx equals fy? 
that means then that for all i, phi i of x equals phi i of y and h i of x equals h i of y. Um, now, for some i, phi i of x has to be greater than zero because it has x has to be in some some set in the open cover, right? So that tells it. So since the phi i's are equal, that means that x and y belong to the same um, open, uh, set in the open cover. Um, so then, since this equals this, right? Because this is the definition of h i, and since these guys are equal and not equal to zero, we can divide by them. So that means we have g i x equals gi y, but the gi are injective, right? Because the gi's are embedded. That means x equals y. And whew, we're two minutes over time. <laughs>